Good morning. It's day 10 on our Let's Make a Sourdough Starter adventure together. And we had a big snowstorm, so it is really cold again. And so we may have to spend a little more time today and give a um, little more attention to my starters. But I have 11 going that I made last night. I have some dough in the fridge that I mixed yesterday. We're going to take it out, put it in front of the fireplace to keep it warm. And I've got 11 that I mixed last night. So I'm going bread crazy. All right, let's get started and see how everything looks. And Grace really wanted to say hello this morning. Say hello, everybody. So let's open these up and have a look. Our sourdough, or our sorghum sourdough starter looks lovely as always. Same with our brown rice and same with our regular sourdough starters. So looking, we can see that it has risen. It's got nice bubbles, kind of similar to how it has been for the last few days. And our bob and our regular sourdough starter. Now, I wanted to mention today that if you have someone in your house that's totally allergic to gluten or a celiac, you do not want to be doing this and making, or I wouldn't recommend you do what I'm doing right now and make uh, gluten-free starters and regular starters. Cause you could be thinking, Oh, awesome. My husband can eat regular bread and gluten and has no problem. So I'll make him this starter and I'll make myself this starter. And it could be okay. But if you have an allergy or your uh, celiac, it may not be a good idea because the yeast and every microorganisms are going to be coming into the air when we're mixing and if we are getting some of the gluten um, into and contaminating our gluten-free starter, that could cause you some problems. So just be careful. My husband has really liked the bread that I've been making with the gluten-free starters. So give it a try and see how it goes. Give it a whirl. And if not, just be very, very careful because it could cross-contaminate. So we have just under 10 minutes of little sort of background education here. And remember, knowledge is power. So I want you to know exactly why you're doing what you're doing and have a basic understanding of the science because then you can make the decisions on what to do so much easier. So please listen. And I think you're going to love it and learn a lot. So now let's talk about the science of fermentation. I love science. So obviously I love science and math. And so I want to make sure that you understand what's going on because all of this will help you when reading future formulas or recipes. So recipes are often called formulas for a reason with sourdough because there's a lot of math involved. But don't worry, I'm going to make this so easy that you're going to think, wow, I can totally do this. So let's talk science. So we've already talked about that the bacteria that's present in our starter produces the acid as a byproduct of the fermentation process. So the acidity of the starter actually increases with time. We've talked about this already. The yeast is naturally present on the grains and it produces carbon dioxide as a byproduct of its fermentation. So, and they do not like acidic environments. So they start to die off as the acidity of the starter increases. So let's talk bulk fermentation. What does it mean? We're going to see the words bulk fermentation a lot in almost every sourdough formula you'll find. Bulk fermentation is also called the first rise. And it's the time that your dough is left to ferment in one single bulk mass. So it starts when you finish mixing and it ends when you shape your dough. During this time, your yeast is happily eating the sugars and producing carbon dioxide, which is causing your dough to rise. The temperature at which the bulk fermentation happens affects the time needed for the bulk fermentation, which is why the formulas always say, for example, between two and four hours. So we will talk a little bit more about the time later. Now a cold ferment, also called a cold retard, happens after the bulk ferment and the shaping. It's not to further rise the dough, it develops a flavor, gives an ease to the scoring of your dough, and even allows you to sort of put your yeast to sleep so that you can bake at a later time. When you use a cold ferment, it gives a more sour taste to your dough and therefore to your bread. The bulk fermentation and the cold ferment are what I like to call the rest and chill. So the rest is the bulk fermentation time and the chill is the cold ferment. 
And kind of like me, you can work, 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 and and skip the chill out time, but you can't skip the rest. Your body cannot work without rest. So I always think of it that way. It is the rest is the time that is absolutely necessary and the chill isn't. If you're like me, I'm a visual learner and an experiential learner. So I love Hendrik from The Bread Code. He explains the science so well. He's like me, he's a self-proclaimed science geek and just loves it. So let's watch his excellent visual explanation of what happens during the fermentation process, because all of this also applies to gluten-free sourdough. And Hendrik's site is just amazing. He's got amazing videos with all sorts of really cool scientific stuff that you should check out. Okay, so let's have a look and see Hendrik's explanation. He does such an excellent job. So we have a starter here, starter one. The red line is indicating the acid. The blue line is indicating the dough volume. Let's first have a look at the acid. The acid inside of your sourdough is created by the bacteria. That's lactic acid and acetic acid. This is what gives the sourdough bread the sour taste. Now a relatively sour starter could have a pH value of 3.9 for instance. Now the dough volume, the inflation of your dough, is done by the yeast part of your sourdough. Over time, the acid is going to increase and then almost coming to a halt at some point. Now the dough volume is also going to increase. But then at some point, it's going to decline again. This, for instance, happens when you're fermenting, and then suddenly your dough becomes very sticky. You're no longer able to manage it. Imagine tiny balloons that are inside of your dough. Those tiny balloons we have to inflate, and that's done by the yeast. When you inflate those balloons to the maximum, that's when you get that beautiful oven spring and a nice looking ear on your bread. Just to pause Henrik a little bit here, when we use gluten-free dough, it is the exact same thing. So the yeast in your starter is also going to create or release carbon dioxide gas, which is then what inflates those sort of bubbles. That's what you call an open crumb is when you have those bubbles that Henrik was just talking about. So when people talk about sourdough and the open crumb, that's what they're talking about the oven spring, that's how much it rises when you bake your bread. So he's talking about the, those balloons, which is basically the carbon dioxide that the yeast are releasing, which then pushes up the dough. So let's continue listening. The enemy of those balloons, that's the bacteria. And not only of the balloons, also of the yeast. In a sour environment, the yeast doesn't work as well as it does in a non-sour environment. So the bacteria is going to pretty much take over at some point. So the yeast starts to work. The yeast is going to increase the volume of our dough. They're inflating the balloons. And at the same time, the amount of acid is increasing and increasing and increasing. And then at some point, we've piled up so much acid that our yeast doesn't like to work that much anymore. And this is pretty much when this happens. Your dough becomes overly sticky and the dough volume is actually going to decrease at some point. This rise and fall of the yeast activity. So if we are going to bake our bread as the yeast activity starts to lower, then it's not going to be able to give us the same amount of rise and as good of an open crumb. So we want it, we kind of basically just have this window between here and here where we can perfectly ferment our dough. So he's going to show us a little trick that makes this window wider so we don't have to be so stressed out about making sure our dough is not over fermented because that is a really, really, really common thing is that people over ferment their dough. So let's listen to what he says about the rest. I now added a second starter to the whiteboard. This starter does not have as much acid to begin with. It starts at 4.2 pH. This might seem a little bit counterintuitive, but in general, the more acid something has, the lower the pH value is. So our dough that has less base acid is going to start the fermentation process with a lower level of acid in general. So pretty much the same thing. It's going to keep fermenting, and then it's also at some point going to reach the max here. Now, the important part about this is the yeast. The yeast is starting pretty much on the same level. The volume increases, increases, increases. But here now, our dough has less acid 
and our dough can continue fermenting more and we can inflate our dough more. Furthermore, we are delaying when we get into this danger zone. So by tweaking our starter, we have more volume and we don't run into over fermentation that quickly. So here with uh Henrik's discovery of the lower base acidity. So that starter started off with less acid in it. And so the acid level is still going to increase due to the bacterial activity, the exact same. But the yeast level, because it's starting off so much lower and it doesn't have as much acid, the yeast will continue to go in its same curve. However, if you look at the amount of time that we have here, before it reaches, look at the time. So this is time going across this axis here. And you could see, look at this, it's rising and it comes way over before the yeast actually see this intersection here is way over here. So before we only had between this time and this time. Now we have from here all the way over to here before the yeast activity starts going down. So now we've actually got a longer window, if you can see that there a longer window where we can um, work with our dough. So this is really cool and I loved his explanation. So that's gonna help us to understand exactly what we're doing and why we're feeding the ratios that we're feeding. So we will talk more about the ratios and that way you'll understand exactly what you're doing. All right, let's get to it. I hope you found that information so helpful and we will not do any education tomorrow, I promise. So let's get to it and discard all but 30 grams of our starter, then tear our scale and feed it 50 grams of water. Tear your scale again and feed it 50 grams of flour. And as always, do the mixeroo for at least two minutes until it's all incorporated well. And of course, it passes the jiggle test. Then do your three C's, clean the edges, Check the elastic level and cover it up and place it in its snuggly spot. And remember, don't throw out your discard. There's so many wonderful things you can make with it. And as always, I've included the list of ideas below in the blog post. And there's just a ton of ideas online. So take a look and see what you can find. You will seriously love baking with your discard. And I'd love to see some pictures of how your starter's doing today. And we'll see you again later this evening when we'll feed our starters again. I hope you have just the most incredible day. Bye-bye.